Fashion Textile Museum that I founded in 2003. Um, in fact, this is my studio, my workrooms that are attached to the side of the studio where we do all of my collection and a lot of the production. And so I will now give you a tour around here. At the moment, as it so happens, since we've only just finished showing in, um, in London Fashion Week, the collection has just gone off to Milan. The cutter is a, on a week's holiday. Right. And the person who is normally doing the patterns, we have a beautiful beaded bodice that I had done in India that we're finishing off a dress with that. So there are various things that are happen, normally happening, but at least it means we're in quiet so that you can see what, what's going on. Wonderful. Um, this is where we work out a lot of the initial designs. As you can see, there's fabric stacked everywhere. There's pieces of unfinished ideas that are all waiting for us to work on mm -hmm. them. There's new fabrics. This is my really fabulous new one that's all silver and printed with sequins that I based on a design that I did in the 1960s. And I'm really thrilled with it. But these have just gone off to Milan and then they go to Paris. Okay. So it's, it's basically a cycle of, of 30 years or it's, it's your own cycle? Oh, it's my own yeah, cycle. Own cycle. <laughs> and then we keep, everything is printed here. And so all of the different swatches are all kept so that we can refer to them. All the printing is done here. Yes. Everything is completely in-house. Um, until, for example, I do Topshop that mm -hmm. you might have seen me in, yes. and Topshop is actually designed here, but printed in India and made in India. All right. Okay. So I'm still hoping they'll take me out there for that production. <laughs> then we come through into my textile design room. Here I have some students working, and they've been here on a two-week placement. All right. So they're very new, so they're trying out new ideas, and I just give them a subject, and they work on that. So they, they work on a project-based We internship. give them a project, but it also is quite good because they can help out and find out what sort of things are involved with the jobs, right. and that it's not all glamorous. Yes. I do a range of printed leather handbags that are being produced in China for an American company. So we take my prints, we do the original bag. I'll just show you one. And then we're doing um, a, a layout for them to do the screen in China mm -hmm. so that they can then print it and reproduce it in China. Right, so that will then go for mass production. That will go for mass production, but we do the original printing and then they sample it in America and then it's going to China. So we're doing the exact layout that they're going to need for working out the handbag. And then various things that we try out and then we just put them on the wall. I live with them, I say, I can't bear living with it anymore or it will change or whatever. I've been working on Aida, the opera. Wow. So this, this is for the forthcoming opera? This, this is for the forthcoming opera that I'm doing. And who, who designs all these? Is, is, is these are all my designs. These are all my original designs here. And then I'm using prints that I have downstairs. When you come down to see the print room, you're going to see actually prints that have been used from 1960s when I started from Royal College. So I still have one or two of the screens, so it will go right through my history, through my... I've still got to write a book about the wonderful trips that I've done in India with... Uh, I did a sari collection, I did a, several ranges with the peacock feathers and the whole of the Indian prints done 1980. 82 and 1986 I think were specifically Indian where I did the blue makeup and things. So when do we see you again coming back to India? Soon I hope. Here we work on, on anything that crops up, both the new textile collections and at the moment Sarah here who works with me as my right hand, we're doing um, correcting a range of plates that we've done for Royal Dalton. I feel as if I were being forced to listen in on an extension telephone. Right. Okay. So these are just a range of plates that we're just completing and doing the corrections before they go into the market. 
a lot of colors, a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of bold colors to be seen in most of the collections. I think that, well, it's nice to have an alternative. People don't always want to wear black. Well, yes. And I hope that pink, the navy blue of India, is never going to change. <laughs> well, I, I was reading through and it, it rightly said that in the 1960s you, you were termed as, as one of the outrageous designers, uh, or, or rather the more dynamic designers who broke away from traditional British fashion. So has it been from the onset that you... I suppose so. I think that's why I didn't fit in and why I had to create things around me. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I just, I just love designing, and I can, and and I, I think of all the places I can think of, India is one of the places that I think really, really appreciates design because I think everywhere you look is designed. And, and was this in, entire idea of? of not being a rebel, but but a little bit rebellious in in the way you you brought yourself up as a designer uh, in 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 the UK, uh, going against the traditional British uh, style of design. How difficult I, was it? I don't say that it it doesn't necessarily get any easier. I just think that if you believe in something enough, and if you're an individual enough, it will come through, and if you believe it and that's what you're doing and you create a style then if I was to change and say all right now everything's black then they might as well go to someone who already does, does black. black they don't have to come to me so this, this you is know your statement. That's they it. come to me for my own statement I mean in music you wouldn't go to Paul McCartney and say well, I want you to sound like a rolling stone <laughs> so I think it's the same thing at some point I ought to show you my sari, I, I don't know, I'd have to find the film of it mm -hmm. because it, it shocked everyone in Delhi at the time because I did saris with panniers underneath <laughs> them and feathers <laughs> and everything and they look wonderful. With this one, you'll be able to undo it now and move it along, won't you, and then put the other one on it. When we, when we move it, mm -hmm. um, I was going to say, because you can't see through it to match it up. Should Get just a piece of tracing paper. Trace that and do it like that. Pin it onto here with crosses. Lift it up. Oh, and just slip it underneath. And you slip it underneath. Oh, right, okay. That's easy. Both of those and finish that one off. And then do a full table. And then do a full table with the other ones. But if you'd have printed that one two colours, you could have moved it on and then done the other one with it. It was only because um, I didn't want to. Uh, with the leathers, once yeah. they've been printed, you didn't okay. want to roll over them. Okay, you do know that you need to really, uh, when you print the next colour, before you take this off, I think you should move your turquoise over, it's wrong, it, it's not It's not registering. Okay. It would be alright for the theatre, but can you see where it doesn't register? Yeah. You need to put tape round, if it's the old ones, you need to put tape round this because the blue isn't joining. So if you print the gold next, if it if it still doesn't fit, then you'll have to move the you'll then have to move the other one forward. Okay. Do you see what I mean? <coughs> okay. So this is the print room where we're printing more samples for the bags. Are these are these plates? Dating back to the 60s. Uh, these ones here are from my, this one, which is fantastic flower print. Mm -hmm. This one relates to 1987 because I've just seen it on the side of the of the sari designs that I did. Right. So that's 1987. <laughs> here relates to a trip to Australia, and this is 19. This one will be 19. 71. The different holes in them because they're old. This one relates to this one will be 1968 here. For example, my Indian feather collection relating to the North American Indians in was it was 1971 and it's registered in my book. Huh? 
Yeah. You forgot that was there. Yeah, yeah. It's quite nice. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but that plastic's very useful, isn't it, for underneath the leather? Yes. Because it the leather otherwise just left yeah. coats and coats of dye on everything, so it's not worth it. Do we need to make this um, underneath there? No. You could. Yeah. You could just go over that slightly. You could just go over that slightly. People keep asking me to do an exhibition about my work before 1965. And this is from 1965 when I did a collection for Fole and Tuffin. Little Stars, that one. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you initially to, to be a designer and, and once you passed out from the RCA. Well, be, your... just right at the beginning, I always loved painting and drawing. Mm -hmm. Then I was very influenced by this fantastic teacher at my first art college who taught textile design and she said, if you want to go further, you'll need to go to the Royal College of Arts. Initially, that's how I came to go to the Royal College of Art. I knew that I just had all these ideas of how garments could look and how they should look. There was no, no one was interested in buying them, so I went directly to designers, which in those days wasn't done. You know, you had big printing factories. Yes. Huge. And people would just buy from what was selected, whereas I went with my designs to a designer and said, do you like these designs? Mm -hmm. And if you do, I will organise getting them printed. Right. So I organised getting them printed and that went all right for about two or three seasons till I started getting very, I'd say, Warhol influence, like I did lipsticks and teddy bears and all sorts of things. Well, they didn't want those, they just wanted stripes. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is going to happen all the time. Unless I do my own collection, no one's going to buy it. No one's, yeah. everyone's going to, one season and then that's it. Yeah. So. I ended up in 1969 putting my own collection together, taking it to America, mm -hmm. and the High Priestess of American Vogue, Deanna of Reland in those days, yes. photographed them on Natalie Wood and they became the rage of New York and consequently around America. Right. And then I thought I'd find a backer, but I didn't find a backer. Mm -hmm. And I came back here and just continued designing and at one time I had a shop and then just doing very specialised clothes. Mm -hmm. And then also in 1977, I did a collection with tears and safety pins, just ahead of Vivian, mm -hmm. and with beaded tears. And that was, um, and so I was called the High Priestess of Punk for a while. Is a designer, once, once, once you're a designer, does the designer have to follow uh, a specific field in design, or being a designer, they should experiment in any form of design? It, I think it's really up to the designer whether you choose to experiment or fit only into one field. Mm -hmm. As it so happens, I'm a designer that started off doing pattern. Right. So the pattern could be equally as an inlay on a table, it could be a wallpaper, be it could be carpet, it could be anything that you live with. Mm -hmm. And as such, I live in a world of pattern and I'm delighted when anyone comes to me and says, would you like me to do a range of furnishing fabric? I got do a range, as long as I believe in what the company does. Yes. You know, if, yes. I mean, I, I've been approached several times, but it's never come off. I mean, I'd love to work with an Indian sari company and mm -hmm. do the range, you know, because I think I've got my own things I could add to it. Right. So I think that's really where the situation lies. You, you do design and I feel always I'm lucky to be a designer and I enjoy all aspects and I like to think that I live it completely. I mean, it's wonderful living in a, a pink and orange building designed <laughs> by Ricardo Ligaretta, the Mexican um, architect. So, 
you know, there's all those aspects. That's, that's the fashion in the textile museum yes. next door. I right. Well, I, what happened was I mm -hmm. sold my house that I had in Notting Hill Gate mm -hmm. that bought the initial building. Mm -hmm. And then the building was divided off so that I had a flat on the top. So, and the museum's one part of it that's now been taken over by mm -hmm. Newham College of Further Education. All right. And the, the ground floor is staying as a museum and they're at the moment refurbishing it right. with cases that will have a lot of my work in initially, mm -hmm. but then will change over and show different things yes. that we've gradually got for the mm -hmm. museum's collection. And very importantly, I think eventually the Learning Centre should actually have a full catalogue of textile designers because people design the fabric we have not mm -hmm. just and the print, not just the fashion designer getting all the yes. credit for using yes. a lovely piece of of lace that he's found. Someone designed that lace. Right. So you need and to I think that. time has come when there should be equal credits, credits. for things. Welcome here to my studio, which is joined to the side of the Fashion and Textile Muse Museum that I founded um, in 19... Oh no, start again. Welcome to the Fashion and Textile Museum that I founded in 19... I didn't. 2003. <laughs> oh. 